Hey guys, and welcome back to another Kerbal Space Program video. Um, as you can see here, we're uh, going to be going to Duna today, uh, and I'm building the rover uh, that we're going to be sitting, uh, sending. It does not have a probe core, uh, so, we are, so we are going to be sending up Kerbals, and we will get them back just fine. Um, if you want to skip the build, um, skip to roughly halfway through the video, um, although I think the builds are sort of interesting, you know, th they sort of have an artistic spirit to them. So, uh, you can see me here building the rover. I really like this rover design. It has a really low center of mass, so it's, uh, really easy to handle. It's not flip-happy like a lot of rovers in this game are. Um, it just has a really low center of mass. I was going to put a, uh, a scanning arm on it, so we could scan some of the... Uh, DLC rocks and stuff that there uh, is on Duna from the Breaking Ground DLC. Although I actually forgot the scanning arm, so we aren't going to be able to do that. So the rover doesn't have much purpose because we could have just put all of the um, deployable science on the actual craft. But uh, hey, whatever. It kind of looks cool, and we can venture out and explore Duna. Uh, it, so, you can see me here putting a bunch of batteries on it. It does have solar panels, and then we also have the batteries that sort of clipped into the uh, science containers. I sort of thought it looked cool as a background. But we have a bunch on the roof of the vehicle, just so it can go pretty much forever without uh, having to s stop and recharge. Um, the batteries are sort of overkill, but, you know, it's whatever. Um, I think the design with the batteries on top kind of looks really cool, and so uh, that's why I put it there doesn't serve much purpose, but, uh, you know, most rovers in this game don't really serve much purpose outside of the scanning arm, which, of course, we sort of forgot, so it doesn't really matter. Um, the rocket that we built for this was, uh, way overkill for it. Um, it's certainly Drez capable, um, uh, probably it pole bop capable, maybe Elu, but I'd have to do a bunch of gravity assists, so, um, you know, considering this is sort of a guide series, you know, um, I don't really want to be doing complex gravity assists. Although, when we go to Jewel, um, I will be doing some gravity assists just because, you know, Jewel with Tylo and Lathe, it's just so easy to get some Delta V savings with the gravity assists. And if you don't know how to do get gravity assists, I'm sure I'll explain it when I uh, go to the Jewel system. Um, this is an Apollo-style uh, mission. Um, I was considering doing a direct ascent mission. That's sort of why I built the rocket so big. And then I was like, you know what? Screw it. We'll do a uh, Apollo-style. Because although direct ascent is possible with Duna, in fact, it's not too hard. The rockets are way bigger. And, you know, at this point, if you're doing an, an interplanetary mission, you should just learn how to dock. Um, I might do some sort of, like, space station in the future, where I can give sort of a rundown on how to rendezvous, if you guys want that. Um, but Scott Manley, you know, has a few tutorials on it. Um, I'm sure other KSP YouTubers do. Um, it's just, you know, Doc, it, KS, it, I, if I was gonna make a, uh, rendezvous tutorial, I'd have to make it, you know, or add my own little thing. And I think Scott Manley just does it really good. It's probably you know, six or seven years old at this point. Um, so, you know, the aerodynamic model has been updated since then. But, you know, you can get the gist of what he's saying and probably do it. If, you know, it, I would recommend if you're just starting out on Rendezvous, you know, to learn, first off, learn the correct way the docking ports go. I know I personally, when I was learning this game years ago, you know, struggled to, you know, remember which way the docking ports go. But, um, you know, I would just recommend sending up a couple probes, maybe in the same launch, and just, you know, dock them together, undock them, you know, separate them by a few kilometers and bring them back together. Uh, and then eventually, once you do that, sort of, you know, do them in separate launches. Uh, I'd recommend something like an ion probe with, you know, solar panels and a docking port, not much else, just because you have so much Delta V in that, that, you know, you can pretty much do... Uh, whatever you want, whatever you need, and if it's a small probe, the low thrust weight ratio of the ion uh, engines really isn't that much of a problem. Really, I'd recommend sending an ion probe as your first interplanetary mission in general. Just 
if you're not going to land on it, just, you know, send a probe to, like, Jewel. You know, practice getting an encounter there, you know, gravity assists. And I think that's a great way to learn, you know, gravity assists or uh, getting interplanetary encounters. Because, you know, you have plenty of excess Delta V, you know, why not learn that way? Uh, so you can see me here constructing the rocket. I could have done an inner stage uh, with nuclear engines, but nuclear engines just take so, so long to burn. So instead, I used my favorite engine in the game, the Rhino engine. Actually, this is the uh, lander I'm building here. But uh, when I built the inner stage, I used the Rhino engine uh, because it's just so great. It's great as like a mid-stage booster. You know, uh, it's. I wouldn't really recommend using it as a first uh, stage booster because it's not really meant for that. And the ISP on a uh, for a first stage booster, it's really not optimized for sea level. But you know, you could use it. It has a good enough thrust to weight ratio for that. Um, and it just, it's a great engine. It's so big. You know, it. You know, it's very efficient in the vacuum. So I used the Rhino engine. And then I did use the nuclear engine on the way back, but we didn't have a lot of cargo, so, you know, it's not, not that big of a deal. Here's my lander. This lander is overbuilt. It has way more fuel than it actually needs. I used an arrow spike, and then, of course, since the arrow spike can't gimbal, I used uh, four reaction wheels. You'll see me put them in in a minute. Um, four reaction wheels on those uh, side tanks uh, to control it. Uh, this lander is overbuilt. It really does not need to be this um, this big, but uh, I built it this way anyway because, you know, why not? It doesn't need to be that big, and I sort of wanted to fill the space of that fairing up there. So, you know, it's a cool little lander. I do like the design of this craft. You have, may have noticed that this craft is sort of bullet-shaped, and that will actually pose a problem when we get to Duna because, uh, well, you'll see but uh, it's sort of aerodynamically backwards because it causes so much drag one way and so little the other. It sort of acts like a bullet and, you know, nosedive is towards doing that. But those parachutes do help us out and we do end up making a successful landing at Duna. It was a good mission, really. <laughs> uh, you can see me there putting some struts. I did use liberal auto strut in this uh, mission. I would recommend auto strut. Some people consider it cheating. But I don't think it's cheating. It's really not that uh, that cheaty. It just you know w waves away the kraken, w mind you. Uh, it could be considered cheating. You do have to go into settings to turn it on. But it just you know struts are ugly and auto struts not ugly. So I used auto strut. Shoot me. Uh, so uh, we did use auto strut, but it's not that big of a deal. So you can see me here constructing the return stage. It's, Again, in Apollo style, so we will come up and dock with this little mothership here um, with a nuclear engine. Although at that point, we're not really pushing a lot of cargo, so the nuclear engine's thrust to weight ratio isn't that big of a deal when we're coming back up from Duna. Um, so we put most of this craft at a fairing. I could have used engine plates for a lot of it, but uh, engine plates, you know, they're big and bulky and sort of ugly. So there's the Rhino engine. Um, I love the Rhino engine. It's my favorite engine in the game. It's just so great. So it's this rocket really is overbuilt. Um, I could probably, I'm probably gonna reuse this rocket really. Um, so you might not see a build um, uh, montage in one of my next videos because uh, really uh, this rocket's overbuilt. So I would like to reuse it to something that requires a little more Delta V. So I might send this to, like, the Jewel system. Uh, Drez is so boring. I could send it to the Drez Canyon, but... Oh my god, Drez is boring. It's just, it requires so much Delta V to get to, right? Way more than Duna. And then you have to land, circularizing around an object the size of the Mun at, interplan at interplanetary speeds is, you know, annoying because you're going way faster and it takes way more Delta V. You can't really use a, uh, I guess you could use a gravity assist off something like EVE because EVE takes less delta V to get to, and then you could, you know, go back up till Drez height, but why bother? You're talking such a long mission then, you know, and I don't really want to use gravity assist since this is, you know, KSP guides and gravity assists are sort of an advanced technique. 
I'm sure I'll uh, give everybody a rundown on gravity assists when I go to the jewel system, just because gravity assists are so easy in the jewel system. You can just pop off Lathe or Tylo and just get a quick gravity assist, and it's really not that hard. So we'll give a, do a rundown when I go to the jewel system. So you can see the rockets built there. Um, I did use the Might engines uh, for the separator of the boosters. Separator of the boosters? Instead of the Separatrons, because you need so many Separatrons for large boosters like those. And I really just wanted to give it a little kick off the launch pad. So it's already passed, but um, for the gravity turn, it should be pointing about 45 degrees by 10 kilometers. Um, this was not a perfect uh, ascent, but it's a pretty decent ascent. It wasn't that bad, and uh, we, we circularized pretty, pretty efficiently. So we're already using the Rhino engine, and then we'll use this for, you know, the bulk of getting, of circularizing at Duna. Um, and then we'll finish off with a nuclear engine, just giving little puffs there to finish off our circularization. So you can see me using a mod here, Transfer Window Planner. I would absolutely recommend you get this mod because it just saves so much time and energy. Um, to get to Duna, you need a 45 degree or 44.6 degree transfer window. So if you drew a line from Kerbin to the Sun to Duna, that uh, Duna would be 44.6 or 45 uh, degrees in front of Kerbin, and that's one, when you want to uh, start burning prograde relative to Kerbin to raise your orbit and to Duna's height. Um, so in, instead of sort of eyeballing it like most people without mods do, there is the mod transfer window planner to uh, to plan your uh, your transfer windows, transfer window planner. So yeah, um, I also use better time warp in this uh, in this mission, but you can, could totally do this mission without it. I'm just lazy and don't want to wait forever for my burns to take. So I use better time warp. So you can see me here lowering my periaps around Duna. Um, again, just burn at that 45 degree angle, uh, prograde relative to Kerbin and you'll get an encounter with Duna. I think I did do one interplanetary correction burn, but it's not a big deal. So we're burning to circularize here around Duna, just finishing off that maneuver node, taking some thumb, uh, thumb, uh, what's the word, uh, thumb scale? Why am I forgetting? F thumbnail, there we go. <laughs> totally blank there. Um, thumbnail uh, shots, but uh, we circularized around Duna. Um, Duna's atmosphere starts at 50 kilometers, so uh, that's sort of a good target. Uh, I'd recommend a little above that. I think for I went for like mid 80s here, especially with this lander being so overbuilt. It's you know really easy to uh, rendezvous with something like there. So I'm trying to transfer the uh, I transfer the crew there. Zebedai is going on a lone mission down to the surface into that uh, Gemini capsule that's in that solar fairing at the top and we'll just enter the atmosphere. You don't need a heat shield for Duna. Duna's atmosphere is so thin, um, but you can see I uh, pointed like directly into the ground, which was not a uh, ideal circumstance, but those parachutes and drogues slowed us down enough and the little puffs of the verniers. And we are landed, although I meant to close it, but I had that decoup decoupler still at the bottom. So we're sort of here littering the surface of Duna with our space debris, and there's Ike in the background, sort of a cool little fun, uh, shot. Uh, so we have the rover here, um, I sort of blew up the separator there, but it's all okay, the rover was just fine. So this rover's a really great uh, rover, low center mass, handles really well on the surface of Duna. If you do want to drive it or copy this design, go ahead. I'm sure other people have already uh, built stuff. It's not like I'm taking credit for this design. I'm sure other people have certainly built rovers like this. Um, you will want to turn the SAS wheels, the reaction wheels, on the uh, lander can to SAS only, and then turn off SAS when you're driving it around. Um, so it handles and doesn't flip. But it's low center of mass, so you can just turn the SAS on and flip it back over if you do, like, hit something and flip it over. So it's a really great handling rover. So we're just 
here deploying our little deployable science here. Um, we have the weather analyzer, the solar panel, seismometer, uh, commutron, just all that. Uh, it's really, you know, I, I like deploying it. It leaves a little mark more than just a flag on the surface. And, you know, it gets good science. So here I accidentally flipped the rover, but just turn on SAS and uh, those reaction wheels and flip it right back in. It's all good. So we have finished our duties on the surface of Duna. We have little Jebediah going back up. Oh, and he fell down. Going back up to the uh, land leaving, leaving craft the ascent module and I accidentally put the verniers on so that's a little fail reloading the quick save there thought I'd leave that in just as a little you know funny moment so uh, I disabled the verniers obviously here because you know uh, failed and it didn't automatically switch to the pod Zeb was in and I was like quickly tabbing through so very annoying but I managed to get it back we are uh, raising our uh, Apoapsis to meet with the mothership. I launched it like the perfect time, and I, and I uh, generally am unlucky with that, but uh, we launched pretty and, uh, great, really, and got a uh, very close separation. Uh, here we are burning retrograde relative to the target, and then burning towards target, just to close in those separation markers. And, uh, yeah. Uh, in general, this rendezvous went pretty smoothly. There's the mothership there. Um, uh, here's, I think, Matt Lown sort of, uh, what's the word, uh, originated, uh, discovered this method, although I think it was the game intended this way, but anyway, you uh, set the target, um, this set the docking port as target, and then focus on target with SAS, switch to the other ship, uh, set to target with SAS on that too, and just let them slowly guide together. Although, that does not work with ships that don't have like a front-facing docking port, so a lot of space shuttles will have it on like the back or the belly with the uh, M MK-1 or a Mark II uh, inline docking ports, so it's sort of harder to do with that, but it's not too big of, the, too big of a deal. So here we are, leaving uh, the Duna Sphere of Influence, uh, I also, again, using Transfer Window Planner here, um, uh, plotted our transfer window t for the return to Kerbin, and here we are. Uh, we did not end up getting a, uh, uh, a perfectly equatorial orbit back on Kerbin, so we were not able to get a perfect landing at the, uh, Kerbal Space Center, but with Duna, you're coming in at such low, you know, uh, speeds, relative, you know, interplanetarily speaking, Duna's not that far from Kerbin, so you're really not coming in at very high speeds, so I did it up instead of arrow breaking, circularizing at Kerbin, but it, since it wasn't quite equatorial, um, I ended up landing in the waters off the shore of the Kerbal Space Center, which, you know, it's not that big of a deal. Here, here we are, you can see the Kerbal Space Center there, and uh, we sort of landed a little bit south to it, but I'm sure they have ships. Uh, and here if you realized, I actually forgot parachutes on that capsule, so we had to have Jeb, uh, and I, was it Bill or Bob? I never remember who I take on these. Um, ditch and land in the water with their own parachutes, but not a big deal. And here we are, gliding down to meet Jebediah in the water. So thank you for watching, guys. I uh, hope you enjoyed the video. This was a little bit longer, but uh, give me suggestions uh, down below, and thanks for watching. Later, guys.